April 2015, Terry Eagleton published an essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education titled The Slow Death of the University, in which he lamented the erosion of the distance that traditionally existed between universities and society at large, a distance that enabled universities to, quote, reflect on the values, goals, and interests of a social order too frenetically bound up with its own short-term practical pursuits to be capable of much self-criticism. The critical distance, Eagleton continued, is now being diminished to almost nothing as universities capitulate to the hard-faced priorities of global capitalism. Eagleton's critique apparently touched a nerve. Uh, um, the slow death of the university was listed first among the top reads of 2015 um, that most strongly connected with the readers of the Chronicle of Higher Education. Eagleton is particularly concerned with the capacity of the university to serve as a center of humane critique. For him, humanities in particular, must be a protected site from which to launch a critique of conventional wisdom. This is one thread of an enduring proposition that universities' relationship to their societies, societies in which they're embedded, and, and in particular, their relation to power, whether it's embodied in the state or in other forms, should be one of autonomy and separation. The university, from this perspective, can best play not only the role of social critique, but also its other roles of pursuing knowledge and educating individuals by remaining a place set, asart, set apart from the world around it. Eagleton is reacting in part to the relatively recent transformation of higher education in the UK through the state assessment exercise, which awards points and fuel and, and funds, um, especially for contributing research with an immediate economic impact, uh, which um, Eagleton says is turning universities into ancillaries of entrepreneurship. But the, but the new system in the UK is just one manifestation of a similar transformation of higher education that is much more widespread. The growth of what British anthropologist Susan Strathburn calls audit culture has been justified by the idea that legitimate stakeholders, future employer, employers, tax play, payers, legislators, parents, and others, want universities to focus on certain practical kinds of research and job training, <clears throat> and it's, to some extent, to cater to the immediate needs of corporate employers who now demand specialized job training be completed at universities, training that used to be the responsibility of corporations themselves. In the view of some scholars of the contemporary academy, the ultimate roots of this situation lie in neoliberal policies that have led to an increasing concentration of wealth almost everywhere. The fundamental economic changes or these fundamental economic changes have been accompanied by new concepts and assumptions, a cultural logic that addresses each as an individual. Education becomes almost entirely a private concern. Its benefits are individual, so its costs must be individually borne. This has alarmed a great many academics and spawned the new field called critical university studies. Now, in my view, we must be careful about waxing nostalgic about the wrong things. A few short decades ago, British universities were more separate and more autonomous, but also more elite. Uh, they may not have been for the 1%, but they were certainly for the 5%. The democratization of uh, universities began in the US with things like the GI Bill in the early 1950s and expanded until more than half of all high school students had entered universities. And similar, if less dramatic, democratization followed in Europe and many other parts of the world, and even in the UK. A research university, when it's working well, has as its central feature a commons. Research requires a conversation that is profoundly open. Academic review and debate assumes that more wisdom emerges from such a process than from any one person thinking alone. In essence, 
It is based on a commitment to thinking as openness to the questionability of things. It also implies an equality of participation. That is, scholarly questions turn on the value of the insight and the argument, not on the status of the person think speaking. The academic commons demands that privileges of rank, social status, and the like are irrelevant, at least theoretically. The heart of the teaching function is, as Jeff Noonan puts it, awakening and cultivating the love of thinking. While information acquisition and skill development are always involved, they are not the end of education. <clears throat> that involves the cultivation of thinking and questioning. Higher education succeeds and, and research succeeds when students and faculty members experience a conversation that constitutes a commons. But what happens to this commons when confronted with the onslaught of neoliberal pressures and their cultural logic? What is de-emphasized is the role of higher education in educating citizens to think and to question so as to participate more fully in democratic life. Democracy requires that the rights of free assembly and free speech are not confined to campuses. They are the rights of all citizens. Historically, the question of academic freedom became urgent in higher education at the exact moment when wider freedoms were being demanded by Enlightenment thinkers and contemporary political revolutions in places like France. This conjunction implies that the university's autonomy and its preservation of open debate and research is, is directly connected to the development of spaces of civic freedom that is outside of the university. But under the logic of neoliberalism, higher education is no longer a public good. Education is addressed to individuals as something to be privately consumed. The danger here can be grasped by an analogy to what has happened to the urban street. In democracies, the right of assembly and free speech has a location. These things exist in the street. That is, they exist in public space where issues can be contested and negotiated. No one has the right of assembly or free speech in somebody else's house, only in public space. Shopping malls may seem to replicate the function of the urban street. They certainly look like an urban street. But if you try to take a photograph or hold a little demonstration against a retailer who, say, discriminates against women, you'll find that you are in private space under the control of owners. Contemporary political economy almost everywhere leaves university presidents with little choice but to chase the concentrated wealth now in the hands of fewer and fewer billionaires. Presidents may attempt to maintain a wall between the desires of such owners and their own decisions about education and research. But knowing well that they may, must go back to these donors again and again, and knowing that their own leadership will be judged partly according to the resources that get, they garner, means that the wishes of donors may play a key role in setting university priorities. Hence, there's a danger that campuses will become less like the street and more like the mall places where people are addressed only as individuals who consume, places where a community of inquirers is out of place. When wealthy donors demand accountability, it is similar to the US Supreme Court ruling that defines corporations as people who have the right of free speech. But money not only talks, it can also drown out human voices. The university becomes shot through with private power and a cultural logic that demands that students focus like a laser on getting ready to enter the job market and to turn away from the conversations that are traditionally been, have traditionally been at the heart of the academic commons. People like Eagleton worry about the power of concentrated wealth to breach the university's walls. He would like stronger walls. While I completely understand this argument, it is the realities of higher education in the Arab region that convinces me 
that there are more dangers in demanding separation than in encouraging engagement. There are a host of new universities in the Gulf that claim academic freedom within their walls, but have very little connection to any zone of civic freedom beyond these walls. The proponents of the establishment of branch campuses and similar internationalization schemes by Western universities often argue that these institutions will be agents of long-term positive change. I understand that these campuses may introduce progressive ideas. They may allow young women access to an education they would otherwise not have. And to the extent that these students experience a genuine academic commons and they cultivate a love of thinking and questioning, these campuses may slowly help subvert authoritarian regimes. Others, however, argue that such initiatives <clears throat> help to legitimize authoritarian regimes, especially when they coexist with Western military bases and political support for these non-democratic regimes. One thing is clear. Such universities have a remarkable apartness from the societies that surround them. The history of the American University of Beirut reveals a very different relationship to its setting, something it shares to some extent with other Lebanese and other Arab universities. In the 150 years since its founding, AUB has increasingly become more of an Arab institution. Its gates are open to intercourse with the city, the country, and the region. So despite its elite connections to the United States and its English language of instruction, it has been a key site in which Arabs have debated modernity and its cultural, economic, and political ramifications. It's a site in which global ec academic perspectives have engaged directly with anti-colonial movements. Despite the tumultuous history of Lebanon, the AUB campus has remained comparatively open and free. The main reason for this is something difficult to reconcile with predominant Western views of the Arab world. In Lebanon, there has developed a space of civic openness. Perhaps it's forged in part because of Diversity, diversity of Lebanon and the need for people to compromise with each other and to uh, negotiate. But if there developed a kind of commons, a zone of free conversation on the AEB campus, it has a counterpart in a civic commons that is palpable in Lebanon's free press, its religious freedom, and its vibrant movements for change. Of course, this is, this is not unique in the Arab region but it is very distinct from what is happening in the Gulf um, monarchies. It is this setting that allows AUB to host intense debate on the issues of the day, to remain a key site in the Arab world for the humanities and the critical social sciences. Moreover, because it is an American university in which Arab perspectives are carefully articulated, has a role to play in an era in which such voices are smothered by Western prejudices or the region's own repressive regimes. The contrast between the history of AUB and Gulf counterparts convinces me that what most effectively protect, protects the academic conversation, the academic commons, is the presence of spaces of conversation and debate outside of the university. I agree with Eagleton that universities should be places to consider things beyond the immediate practical, the immediately practical, and to confront how we actually live with how we might live. But engaging with similar impulses beyond the university enriches this conversation and allows for repressive forces to be contested at both sites. If such activities are sequestered in the academy only, they are to some extent contained and neutralized. Now I know this argument runs counter to the thinking of many academic progressives who are appalled that their institutions are so deeply involved with corporations, governments, and commerce that they seem unfit any longer to question conventional wisdom. 
But if in attempting to lessen these influences, we push for greater and greater autonomy and separation, we may lose what we, we value most. Today, progressive academics are at a complete loss. The forces arrayed against the vitality of the academic commons seem ubiquitous and nearly omnipotent. Fighting these forces from the campus can seem like a lost cause, a rear guard action of hunkering down within nested walls. I want to suggest a different strategy for protecting and strengthening the academic commons. It, it must reach out and engage with spaces of freedom beyond the campus. The counterpublics forged by subcultural groups, the phenomenon of art striving for autonomy, social movements, the fourth estate, the press, the fifth estate, non-mainstream media, and other democratic forces that have an affinity to the academic commons because they too value thinking, questioning, and a fundamental equality. Conceiving of universities as open to their surroundings and indeed to the world rather than as bastions of separate freedoms is the most effective way to gain some leverage, to generate a counterforce to the forces that are currently stifling the academic commons. In fact, the space within the university and the space of civic life are both contested domains in which many forces are present. Although there is no complete agreement in either realm, hermetically sealing off one from the other is a recipe for eroding the conversations and engagements that foster hope. Thank you. Thank you.